Um, so one of the major challenges with oil sands isn't just the, the open pit, the mu surface mineable area, uh, but it's also the in situ or say the area. Um, the mineable oil sands, as we know, is quite small, 3% of the total reserves. 97% is the SAG B in situ. So from a biodiversity standpoint, uh, although this has you know, a complete loss of biodiversity within that area with reclamation following, you know, roughly 15, 20% of the area is disturbed in the SAG B in situ disturbances. And one of the major questions is, to what effect does that change of biodiversity? How much are edge effects associated with these? And the unique aspects of the fragmentation associated with the in situ disturbances is that they're linear. And in conservation, we're often talking about increasing connectivity. But there's well-known disadvantages of connectivity. Increasing invasiveness, um, you know, predators. Basically, you're increasing movement. And in some situations, we do not want to increase movements. Um, so, and again, you know, obviously that's over a quite a broad area, 142,000 square kilometers. That's the size of uh, the state of New York in the scale of the bitumen footprint. So some of this would be a, I guess, a fairly typical SAG B uh, in situ operation, pipelines, infrastructure, and the seismic lines. Well, these seismic lines here are shown uh, with like 3D seismic lines or narrow, low impact seismic lines, often two meters or, or less. But there's also a large legacy of seismic lines, um, 2D seismic lines that are spread apart a little bit further, um, often a couple hundred meters. They're usually wider and they've been on the landscape a lot longer. And there's still quite a bit of these, of these structures. And of course, one of the issues that has been pushing um, conservation issues around linear features and disturbances in general, the boreal forest is of course the woodland caribou and a recovery strategy, which suggests that within the caribou ranges, at least 65% of the total area should be left as undisturbed. One of the challenges being that if you buffer, if you use different buffer sizes around disturbances, you quickly lose all the habitat. So some buffers of 500 meters have been suggested, and that pretty much doesn't leave much for caribou. Um, and if there are thresholds set eventually on disturbances, then that's going to force a tremendous amount of effort on restoration, and there is some ongoing restoration to, uh, to look at this. What I'm going to talk about is two different projects we've been working on, one uh, referred to as dark disturbance and, and recovery trajectories, and the build project. DART we've been doing the last three years, Vic Leifers and myself are, are uh, co-PIs on, on this particular project, and more recently I've been working with the government as part of the landscape management plan, trying to scale up some of the questions around prioritization of restoration efforts. So in the DART project, we looked at, um, at a, more of a local scale, with a smaller study area, uh, southeast of, southwest of Fort McMurray, uh, in the Stony Mountain area, and then across the lower Athabasca, south of Lake Athabasca, um, scaling up, trying to look at where are there areas that uh, would be prioritized for, for restoration efforts. But we first have to understand what are some of the initial responses of the vegetation, the woody vegetation on these, on these legacy uh, disturbances. So first, this uh, a DART project, uh, this is phase one, we've been uh, looking at continuing a phase two uh, approach to this project. But within the Stony Mountain area, we had access to a, a Green Link lineal inventory that gave us information on age and width of lines and different characteristics of the lines. And we had uh, access also to a rich source of LIDAR uh, data that had been interpreted to wet areas mapping. So we had some information on depth to water, and other sources of information, as well as the point cloud of the LIDAR to give us vegetation height. And we basically mined that data, used that information, as well as some ground plots to verify. But we used the LIDAR data to essentially create a bunch of plots, 600, 863 2 by 50 meter plots along the seismic lines. So these are 2D lines that were more than four meters, uh, four meters or wider. And we looked at, well, what's the height, the average height of vegetation along those lines? And how does it vary as a function of the site characteristics, um, the depth of water, different stand ages, uh, things like that. 
So this was work that uh, one of Vic and, and myself's uh, students, Cassidy Van Rensen, had worked on. And uh, this is kind of a summary of the model. There's quite a bit of information here. But what we ended up uh, settling on was using a particular threshold rule of saying if you, if you reach an average height of three meters on these seismic lines, you're on a trajectory towards forest recovery. It's generally a height higher than most shrubs, except for maybe willows. Um, you know, it's higher than the height of caribou or wolf visibility. Um, presumably at that height, you're starting to restrict movement of ATVs and snowmobiles and things like that. So we looked at, you know, what's the, what are the things that are positively or negatively associated with the probability of achieving a three meter recovery along the lines. Uh, for instance, different ecocyte characteristics, if we use kind of a reference or control ecocyte of D, like aspen, kind of a mesic, anything that's highly wet or dry, there's a negative relationship with the patterns of recovery on seismic lines, which makes sense. Um, the depth of the water kind of reinforces that too wet, too dry, these slow recovery rates on seismic lines. Um, there's a slight interaction term with age. Just the age of the line itself, of course, the older it is, the more likely you're going to uh, reach that three meter rule. And line width, the wider you are, the less likely you're recovering. Line bearing, east west lines tended to, it's a slightly significant effect, tend to um, regenerate slower than north south lines. And road distance, in this case, that was a proxy for different human activity. Uh, ATVs and snowmobiles are one of the major things that maintain and keep open a lot of these linear disturbances, the seismic lines. The further are you away from any access, roads, um, the more likely, the more positive um, the recovery rates were, a very strong effect um, relating to that kind of the, the human activity. So these numbers just represent standardized coefficients. Uh, one standard deviation change in road density increases 8.2 logit units or likelihoods of, of recovery into a, a three meter rule. It's a little bit easier to understand rather than uh, these numbers, but actually graphically just demonstrating what some of these responses are. Um, what we have here is three different lines, 10 years after disturbance, 30 years, and 50 years, and the different environmental gradients. So depth to water, uh, initially, after 10 years, it's only the me six sites that have the highest probability of regeneration to three meters, the drier and the, the, the wet sites. Hydric sites in particular have low probabilities, but after 30 to 50 years, it's only the wettest sites um, that tend to restrict or arrest the succession on these sites. Uh, line width, the wider you are, the less likely you are to recover to these, these three meter heights. And distance to road, you know, the further you are away from a road, the more likely you're to recover. And of course, 10, 30, 50 years, you increase your recovery rates. So that just, the important part of that is that allows us, a lot of those relationships are kind of intuitive, but the important part is relating some of the spatial factors that we have so we can extrapolate or predict those relationships in space and time. And so with, uh, the original uh, Stony Mountain area. Uh, this is just a kind of a sensitivity model, the type of habitats that are likely to either recover or not recover at different points in time, 10 years, 20 years, and 50 years, with uh, the darkest, the black areas, those type of habitats that are, are, are able to reach, let's say, this three meter recovery rule. So at a, a local area, you know, there's still some strong relationships that predict the the factors that affect recovery of the, the 2D seismic lines. Now scaling this up to the uh, lower Athabasca, so south of Lake Athabasca, there's 54,893 kilometers of just 2D lines, not the 3D lines. People are spending upwards of 10,000 or 13 to 14 thousand dollars a kilometer on restoration. At 10, at 10 thousand dollars, that's uh, 500. $48 million, a little more than half a billion dollars if you were to so-called restore all these lines. Now, of course, some of them are naturally recovering. So it's not like we'd invest any money in them at all, but others are not. And a lot of the issues come to how do we prioritize our, our restoration actions at these broad spatial scales that we get our most benefit. So there's a trade-off situation. 
we have limited resources to do the restoration. We're not going to do it everywhere. Um, where should we do it? Well, presumably where is caribou, but also other biodiversity values. So this map here represents quarter sections. So roughly 66 hectares in size, and it represents the length of 2D seismic line in each of these quarter sections. So areas that are gray have no, it's a quarter section with no 2D seismic line. Areas that are in red have more than two kilometers of seismic lines in that 66 hectare uh, parcel. So what I've done here is I've collected the information from the government on where these seismic lines are, how much is in each of these quarter sections, and we can use, uh, if I, what I've done is I've generalized the original DART model to be used across a broader landscape of the lower Athabasca. And then consider constraints to restoration um, as well as uh, things that we'd want to value, like biodiversity. And then prioritize some of the restoration actions. Now, just generally, kind of this very general model, uh, what it first suggests is that about 21% of the upland, or well not the upland, the forested habitat, so even forested fens, tend to be those type of sites that are in some kind of arrested succession that are unlikely within 30 years to recover to a three meter height. So their trajectories just aren't there to, to form some kind of forest regeneration and, and natural recovery. 66% uh, however are in type of situations where if at least access management uh, and snowmobiles, ATVs, and those things are managed, have the capability to, to recover at some level, naturally. So this passive form of restoration, the passive form is let it restore itself for those places that have the capability to do that. The active restoration is where the places we really should go and put those resources, the limited resources that we have. 13% uh, are non-forested habitats like graminoid fens and things where you're not trying to recover trees in any particular way. There's some, there's some effects, but the effects structurally aren't the same as forested environments that um, have this linear disturbance. So if I uh, take this, this recovery rule, this three meters, and I've generalized the DART model to suggest where are places likely to recover and where are places likely not to recover. So we can look at the passive form of restoration and the active form of restoration. The passive form is on this side, and those are areas in green this is the percent of the seismic, line, seismic lines in that quarter section that are likely to have some form of natural regeneration capability if managing human access uh, within, that, within that quarter section. Conversely, the, the active restoration side, the red areas, represent those type of places that have a greater percentage um, that, have, that are in this arrested succession, are in areas that don't appear to be naturally recovering places we want to kind of prioritize for restoration actions. So the first thing is to kind of understand where those trajectories are, where there's the na natural capability to recover, and where there are places we'd, be, we'd want to invest the resources into restoration. Now a lot of the effort goes around caribou, um, and uh, in the diagonal uh, lines here, polygons are the caribou ranges. So what I've done here is I've looked at the total length of seismic line that occur inside caribou ranges that are an active or targeted restoration and that are weighted towards areas of existing low human footprint. So there's no reason to do restoration efforts in a seismic line uh, where there's a whole bunch of other footprint already from a caribou perspective. You want to purposely do the restoration in places where the seismic line is like the only line in that quarter section and by restoring that, you get the best benefit for the caribou because it restores the functional habitat for, for caribou. So the areas in dark red represent those kind of quarter sections that have high areas of arrested succession or active restoration, those areas that have low human footprint and that occur in the caribou range. Now the other way of looking at it is the active to passive restoration ratio. So here, these are again the same areas that are identified that inside caribou range, these are areas that have a lot of seismic lines, but ideally if we're moving equipment and doing restoration actions, you'd want to go to the places that have the highest concentration of arrested succession or active restoration, where the ratio is mostly uh, uh, active restoration, not passive restoration. 
we don't necessarily want to disturb with um, excavators and other things down the seismic lines that are having some form of, of existing uh, passive restoration or natural regeneration on them. So kind of trying to look at where there are areas of high active restoration and low uh, passive restoration. Now there, there's constraints to this, uh, to this process and the constraints is, if we really think about it, are areas that have um, existing footprint. So these are quarter sections. Again, these are little tiny quarter sections with zero to 100% human footprint. Footprints of whatever, it be a town, a highway, well pad, seismic line or whatever. And uh, this is the bitumen pay thickness, that is a relative index between zero and 100. So the areas in red here represent the highest payload thickness of bitumen. So these two represent either a current footprint or presumably what would be in the, our future footprint potential with, with either existing or, or future plans in, in, in situ or uh, mineable oil sands. It doesn't make any sense to do restoration, if, again, if you're prioritizing restoration in places that already have a lot of disturbance or are going to be disturbed in the future. So this is really a constraint on the trade-off in the restoration. We'd be doing those elsewhere. Next slide here is, but we would also ideally want to do these, not necessarily just where caribou are. Caribou are kind of the first species, but also places that have caribou plus other biodiversity. Not all places are the same, so we'd want to consider other, our other values, other biodiversity values. So what I've done is I've taken 62 different indicators, 61 species in one coarse filter habitat, the, the fens, which are very difficult to restore if, if disturbed. And I looked at the distribution of those within the lower Athabasca with different models. Some models provided from ABMI, Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute, and some provided from my lab from different projects I have ongoing, such as um, uh, the EMCLA Environmental Monitoring Committee for Lower Athabasca and a SEMA project where we're looking at rare plants, where's the distribution of the of rare plants and the type of habitats, and 16 different fruiting species, shrub species, that are valuable for aboriginal values or, or wildlife as well. That's just a, an overlay of all 16 species and the habitat associations of those fruiting shrubs. I can take each of those individual species and look at the distribution of those species for each quarter section and ask, well, okay, now what is there for a restoration priority and what is there from a biodiversity priority? Wouldn't it be great if we did it in places where we had the ability to target restoration and target biodiversity value at the same time? So really looking at those. The way I've done that is um, uh, to prioritize the restoration actions using kind of the restoration priority approach that I've kind of described as well as a biodiversity prioritization approach. So we've ranked, I've ranked the active uh, restoration sites across the lower Athabasca, and then using a, an optimization program called MarkSan, I've optimized places that have greater or lower value from a biodiversity standpoint. I mean, it's referred to as an irreplaceability value, not necessarily diversity, hot, not hot spots in diversity. You can have areas of very low diversity, but it's the only places those species occur in, so the only way to achieve that conservation goal is to go after those places with low biodiversity. For instance, caribou are a classic example of a species that only occurs in depauperate, poor diversity ecosystems. You increase diversity, you reduce caribou. So the Mark saying is an approach to the complementarity approach, the beta diversity of where are there are places that best satisfy targets and objectives for conservation values. In this case, 62 different indicators and where they are. And um, by having a, a, a matrix here of saying, well, let's, let's consider this irreplaceability value, the biodiversity index, and a restoration index, which I just talked about, and look at a way of prioritizing a simple matrix, uh, uh, restoration versus biodiversity, and prioritize those places that have high biodiversity and high restoration value. So we can take the uh, active restoration values here in red, and biodiversity values for the quarter sections in red. We combine those in various ways and come up with a restoration priority matrix. So here, areas in red represent areas of high biodiversity and high active restoration values. Um, so just up here in the moose uh, climbing area, moose climbing area, different areas scattered throughout the area. Other areas that have high restoration value but lower biodiversity value from the standpoint of the number of things we're 
we're protecting or achieving relative to at least 62 indicators that were chosen uh, for this work. So it's a way of prioritizing the work that's done. One of the one of the issues relative to the restoration that has been done is, for the most part, caribou have been the focus, so Algar or, or LEAP and these different projects that are ongoing. But for the most part, it hasn't been planned at landscape scales, at the broadest scales of where we can achieve overall objectives of biodiversity and as well as recognizing potential natural recovery rates uh, of these areas. Now, specific to considering, well, what does this mean if the Alberta government uh, imposes some form of footprint thresholds? And let's say every kilometer of seismic line that's added or other type of footprint, you need to reduce or balance, offset those disturbances elsewhere. Well, the issue with some of these disturbances is that one, if you so-called restore the seismic line, it's not instantaneous. Just because you plant trees doesn't mean it worked. And it will take time for, there's a lag. There's uncertainty in the fact of whether it'll come back or not, how effective you are in it. There needs to be effectiveness monitoring. And there's also a time lag in achieving some kind of goal or target, such as let's say it is a three meter recovery rate. Those pieces of information inform the process relative to what offset ratios would have to be if you were truly to balance the, uh, the footprints versus the restoration side. So if we think of this in some graph here, we have some time, we have some lay uh, time T1 or T2. If you, if you didn't do anything, you have a certain recovery trajectory. Maybe it takes you know, T2 to reach that point in time, 30 years or 50 years. If we do some restoration action, we can reduce the amount of time change in, in recovery legs um, and in, increase those recovery trajectories. And we can reduce the overall offset ratios that would be imposed in, in that kind of scenario. So the time to threshold recovery height defines one parameter in those offsets. And by default, the offset ratios have to be greater than one since A, there's uncertainty and there's a leg rate in recovery in any of these seismic lines when restoration actions are done. And lastly, the difference in recovery time with restoration is the net benefit that that restoration does. And like Vic and uh, uh, others, have done quite a bit of work on assessing the economics of, of those type of uh, trade-offs. So just kind of wrapping up in some next steps, uh, you know, managing footprint and biodiversity obviously necessitates restoration. That's been ongoing. Uh, a lot of that's been ad hoc to date, um, done not necessarily with regional planning in mind um, or things beyond caribou. But of course, places vary in their values and threats and prioritization and coordination is needed among different industries uh, about where that, that work is done. Approaches to use models like this to help target uh, uh, and estimate legs of recovery and offset ratios I think is an important step. And you know, a lot of this work is, was done with some field work and, and uh, the DART project, the first project, but as well as Algar and these other projects that are ongoing. But ideally, you know, the DART 2 project is uh, is proposed doing experimental manipulations with controls, replicates, to really get a handle on what's the most effective way, civil cultural practices, to speed recovery on these seismic lines. Some of my early work I did in restoration ecology um, was trying to recover a rare ecosystem, uh, oak barrens and pine barrens in the mid uh, United States, the Midwest. And we worked with some agencies, Nature Conservancy, who wanted to reintroduce fire. Because fire had been a natural process in this ecosystem. And they kept using fire over and over and over again uh, with very little or no effectiveness monitoring. They didn't follow up to see whether it worked or not. They just kept spending money. And guess what? It didn't work. And so it's crucial that there is effectiveness monitoring and complemented with experimental designs to, to look at this. You can throw trees in the ground, but it'd be great to make sure that the work is being done as effective as possible. And from what I understand, of course, there's some follow-up, but the more that we can integrate with uh, researchers in a planned uh, uh, approach would be great. Now, just as a last few slides, um, uh, there's, I guess there's a photo of me holding a UAV that Matthew had, so I'll just show a, a, few, a, a few images of some of the, the tools, the other tools we're using to try to look at uh, forest structure and recovery on linear features and lines. So we need ground-based plots. Of course, we need the experiments and everything. LIDAR is crucial to answering this question. It's also crucial to have a revisit of LIDAR, let's say every 10 years, because we can literally measure at a broad spatial scale the whole uh, LARP 
what are the actual recoveries rates and trajectories on these seismic lines. So that's crucial. But at other scales, we can use other tools, such as this is a UAV, a drone, which we can fly. So this is an ortho mosaic photo of that. And this here is a point cloud using uh, structure from motion photogrammetry, where we're basically, you know, new software is basically taking stereo pair imagery. And I guess in forestry, they've been using a long time, but there's newer pieces of software that are basically reconstructing uh, the stereo image of the three dimension, the point cloud, just like what LIDAR is without an active uh, sensor like the, the laser from LIDAR. What we gain with this is much higher resolution. So most of the LIDAR, you can increase resolution on LIDAR, but the broadest data set available is roughly a point and a half per square meter. It's not that dense for measuring things at this scale. So here we're getting about 50 to 60 points per square meter, basically two centimeter pixel resolution, where each pixel is a color and it's at a different height. So we can look at the specific imagery and the structure of these sites. So here is an image of where the UAV was. Each of these planes, the line, represents the image from the UAV taken at different points. And then bringing these together, because we have a lot of overlap in imagery, we can use that information to, uh, to basically measure a very specific structure and elevation and so on. So we can take the, it's hard to see in, the, in this light, but we can take the image and look at the point cloud and the structure within them um, uh, and ideally be using this over time as restoration and other things are happening to, to monitor at a slightly bigger level to complement the ground level plots uh, what the recovery rates are on some of these seismic lines. So just collaborators, Cassie Van Rensen was the master student with uh, Vic Leifers and I on the DART project. Uh, other collaborators, Tim Dingy, Barry White, Jeremy Reed, uh, Nexon, um, now with, I guess, Devin. The BUILD project, Tim Dingy and myself have been doing a lot of that work. Robert Savage from the government, Cassie Van Rensen's helped a little, and Jim Herbers. The UAV work with my uh, research associate, Tobias, Tobias Tan, and uh, these different funding organizations for uh, the linear work that we've been doing over the last few years.